lost. Am I heard clear right there at the back? I'm asking you guys right there, please help me. Am I clear there at the back? Because it doesn't follow when I'm clear here in front, I'm clear there at the back. Because you see between each of this cubicle, you have good, strong, upright beams, you know. Good morning. I'm very glad we can still fill up this place. I wonder which is bigger. The Finster Hall or your place down here at uh, CON. Smaller or bigger, I can only thank God that we have the Sabbath to come together to worship. Amen? We also would like to welcome all your friends who have joined us for this worship. I see some of our brethren coming in straight from our McKilling View Chapel. Welcome to church once more. We would like to extend to you all the greetings of Philippine International Church because we are a part of this campus university or this campus church, I should say. To those of you who just came in, we would like also to let you know we have been running this week series, His Touch, and today we shall conclude this with the last story from the Bible on how Jesus has touched people in His short-lived ministry. In a short while, after we have dedicated once more ourselves, committed, consecrated our head, our hands, our minds, our hearts to the one who has touched many of us. We're also inviting you to join us in the baptism. We're going to witness as we see our classmates, our fellow students from this college join and go down the watery grave. We find happiness when people accept Christ and live a new life with Him. Amen? They were presented this morning with the presence of our college dean at the university family down up there at Philippine International Church. I wish we could also recognize them in this hall. Do we have them here? Are you here, brethren? Can I ask you to please stand up? Do we have one more? Another at the back? Do we have one more? Do we have all of these two? Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. We will continue to pray for you. May the Lord bless you as we see you grow in God's grace in this family of the College of Nursing. We're transferring from Finster to this hall because I believe we've got to make things personal for the last time. Though circumstances may not favor our situation, I have always believed that to worship God, you have also to find a special place. It's not always best to be seated in a classroom with your armchair to think of worshiping God. They say the place goes with the attitude. You know what I'm trying to say? But I do believe that when we have our minds focused to God, classroom or church, we will honor and worship God. Amen? Amen. You know, you are a lot better seated there than I do right here. Exactly right now, I don't know how to finish this story, the last story, because as you came in this morning, I noticed that you're beginning to fill this side. We started only with this column. Am I right? This morning, we came in around 10 minutes to 10. We are just filling up this side. And I was closing my eyes, hearing the testimonies being rendered to the, to the glory of God. The moment after 20 minutes, I opened my eyes. 
we have already filled the entire hall. And comes my big problem. You know what a problem is? I don't know exactly where to stand until now. Because if I would stand exactly right here, it will be very difficult for me to see you people on this side. And so I would try myself to move over this side. How beautiful are you? What am I missing? But again, I would not see those people who are on this side. And finally, I begin to think, why not just simply stand here? I wouldn't survive to preach <laughs> to this post, you know. Good for this family right here in front of me. And so, with all prayers, I was trying to listen to the song, Lord, give me the inspiration for just this last story in this revival series. You know what he impressed me? I surely believe the Lord taught me just this moment that I would choose not to stand in front of this post. But I would prefer to stand somewhere here. Why? Though you people right here on this side are very special and wonderful, I have my wife over here. You know? Sir Pasamba is quick to focus on Mom Joy. Huh? You know why, friends? I strongly believe that if there would be one who should listen to me intently, and as we live going back home, who would tell me when to stop, what are the things that I may have forgotten, what are the things that we need to grow with? How the message of God has been brought across this hall. I would not believe anyone better than my own wife. We have shared this ministry together. That's the reason I brought with me several theology students to the College of Nursing since night one. Because I wanted to impress them that the best partner of a minister, I'm sorry. I think Brother Munrial would agree with me. The best partner for a pastor, definitely for Joe Orbe, will be a nurse. Let's bow our heads for this one. Father God, all throughout this week, you did not only impress us, and edified our faith with your healing touch. But you have taught us as a church that the spoken word will even be magnified to glorify your name when healing is not ignored. Thank you, dear Lord, for the gospel in the words of the scriptures. But we also would like to thank your short-lived ministry exemplifying grace through the healing ministry. Father, as we come together just to study one more story to pack up this entire revival spirit, just as you have been with us from night one, be with us at this very moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Not so much here in the Philippines, but in the United States of America and the other affluent first world countries. In the medical care they provide, when a patient is to undergo a medical process, an operation, by amputation, they just don't include doctors who would attend to the specific medical routine but they would employ a trauma doctor you know what I'm trying to say right here in the Philippines we seldom have that probably not even mamsi but in the affluent countries they knew exactly they have studied carefully 
they have seen and observed in, re in research that the most difficult on the side and perspective of a patient of any surgery process is that of amputation. Whether that be a small finger, whether that be a leg, whether that may be a hand, in an arm, amputation comes with lasting effects of despair. And it can even, on a prolonged basis, cause the patient traumas that will be far unexplainable in its effects. Today, we will prove once more how Jesus excelled above the rest of those who provided healing. Jesus, at the time of his death, found it not a waste of time to extend healing even in unfavorable circumstances. Amen? The Jesus I know, the Jesus who touches someone, the Jesus who provides healing, does not know any unfavorable circumstances. To him, wherever he is present, there is healing. Amazing. The Jesus doctor is not only a doctor of our physical bodies. The Jesus doctor I know is the same doctor of our spiritual ailments. Jesus knew it well how to provide the healing not only for the body but even to the spiritual soul. To this story I invite you to open your Bible into an unusual passage. Yes, to the very last story we will see through the eyes and mind of one who knows better than any of those who have spoken in the scriptures because he was a doctor. He knew what he was talking about when it comes to healing. Nevertheless, he recorded this one so short were the words and verses, but they are never in any way less profound than the others. In fact, it is even more profound as we progress in our study, which I'm going to tell you. Dr. Luke found this passage not incidental to the last few days of Christ's life before he was crucified. To him, it is with a purpose that he places it here. In the same way, there is nothing in your life, there is nothing in your experiences, good or bad, that is incidental in your life. All of this have its purpose at the right time in the mind of our loving God. Friends, there are no accidents in the plans of God. Even before Adam and Eve fell into sin, He provided already for the saving of mankind. Long before this day came, when Jesus was about to be crucified, He saw in His mighty eyes, He saw in the future that indeed our Malchus in this story will lose his ear. But Jesus was just right there when, he need, when we needed Him most. Have you ever felt that, my friend? That Jesus doesn't only come for the last minute. Probably it's you who felt Jesus in the last minute. But Jesus was there all the way from your birth to the time you would realize you need Him. There has never been a point in your life that Jesus ignored or was passively looking at you. If the birds he has named one by one, and for each bird that has fallen, he cared for, how much more does he care for you, my friend? To this time, I'm feeling the gravity of all of this neglect I have done to the caring that Jesus has provided because 
we are to make an important decision for our family. I have never prayed so much since I entered the ministry for the last 17 years than what we had for this week. In fact, I have gone to the comfort room many times in this whole week than any other week in our life as husband and wife. I felt that the more you are encountering decisions, important decisions to make, the more you should kneel down to God. As you make your decisions, gentlemen, in the watery grave in the next few minutes, I want you to think that Jesus will never abandon you as well. When somebody would whisper to your ears that you don't need Jesus, it is the most precious time that you should come to Him. Your life as Christians in a new birth experience should not be characterized by prayerlessness. Prayer is important. Why did I tell you that? Because before we get into verse 47, the beginning of the passage we will consider this morning, you find Jesus who just stood up from his most important recorded prayer in the Bible. That is his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Just before Jesus was ready for the arrest, he spent the rest of the night in prayer. See how important prayer is to Jesus? No miracle has been done for the day that Jesus never prayed for. I begin to suspect that no matter how busy Jesus may have been, no matter how many people he may have healed for that day, those who have touched him, those who have never touched him, Jesus knew them by their names. Whether they have, he have, may have healed by the thousands for that day, Jesus knew them one by one and each of their names. Because Jesus spent much time in prayer. He prayed for the 12 disciples. He even prayed for Judas for that night. Have you ever thought you have gone down so deep in your sins that Jesus no longer cares? I tell you, my friend, even at that night, in the last prayer Jesus was about to make in the Garden of Gethsemane, he had in his mind for Judas. He cared for Judas. At that moment, he was struggling for the name of Judas. He was pleading for God. And yet, even the divine prayer of Jesus will not overrule our freedom of choice. Now we read in verse 47. And while he, referring to Jesus, was still speaking, what did he tell the disciples? While he was still speaking, go back one verse, and while Jesus was saying, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. That was exactly Jesus was saying, when Behold, a multitude, and he who was called who? Judas. You know who Judas is? You know who Judas is? Judas is this fine looking guy. We were told if there's someone aside from Luke who must have followed Judas, Judas must have been the most mean guy among them. He was educated. He knew what he was talking about. He was of a brilliant mind. Probably if a university was already offering a PhD, he would have free. Judas knew in his mind 
that if ever Jesus is to be the Messiah, he must be seated according to his own mind framework. But you see, friends, it seems Judas wasn't using her mind, his mind until this time. Because among the 12 disciples, it was only Judas who was demon-possessed. Are you following me? Remember Peter? Jesus spared Peter. Even Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan. But with Judas, he never overruled the choice of Judas. You see, these people came before the name of Malchus came out in the story. Why? Because we ought to learn that there were these people when Malchus came out. And the first to consider is Judas. Judas came that evening not to kiss Jesus with compassion, with camaraderie, with respect. Judas came that evening because he has to betray the Savior. And we continue and we find these words. And he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them. This is the arresting crowd. And drew near to Jesus to kiss him. If a detachment came to arrest Jesus that night, I am more likely to think that this is no less than 500. Study the history of Roman army. A detachment will tell you that this is no less than 500 soldiers. On foot, in full armor. Can you imagine the throng of people? Are we 500 in this room? Maybe not. The people, the detachment that came to arrest Jesus was of 500. Much bigger than the worshippers in this hall today. Why would the high priest send as much soldiers? And while they were waiting, they were exactly waiting. Right at the hem was Malchus. But before Malchus was the disciple of Jesus by the name of who? Judas. And Judas approached Jesus as have been dealt in their compromise. Judas was supposed to kiss Jesus. With the question of Jesus... We know it pretty sure that it wasn't a kiss of love and compassion. It wasn't a kiss of brotherhood. But it was a kiss to confirm that Jesus is harmless. They knew and they have seen Jesus did all the miracles in his short-lived ministry. He has seen even the demon himself, Satan himself, obey the commands of Jesus. He has seen how he has multiplied the fishes and the loaves of bread. Am I right? He has seen, they have seen Jesus walk on water. They have seen Jesus command the wind and the waves. Is there anything Jesus cannot do? Jesus raised up Lazarus from death. Three days, close to a week, he was buried. When Jesus asked the stone to be rolled over, many of them said, he would stink. And yet Jesus commanded Lazarus to come out of the grave. More likely, this 500 in one detachment knew who was Jesus they were arresting. Nobody among them, even by probably by the thousand, nobody among them would come close to Jesus. Because for one time, when Jesus was sent out of the synagogue, he was almost pushed to the cliff by the enthroning crowd. But the story tells us, Jesus just walked past them 
through the middle. Nobody could touch Jesus. How sure are they? Even if, as they all together attack Jesus, they would be able to hold Jesus. None among them dared to touch Jesus. Probably one, two, three of them have dared to touch the hem of the clothes of Jesus, but not the arms of Jesus. Thus, it was necessary to make Judas, who has been with Jesus all the time, to come close and kiss him. If Judas has been demon possessed, which we find the record during the Passover that Satan entered the heart of Judas. If Judas, who is Satan possessed, could kiss Jesus and not be harmed, for sure they are certain they can grab Jesus by the hand. Friends, how many of us? are like this detachment that includes Judas and Malchus who would like to challenge the authority of Jesus we would like to do the sin of presumption if it doesn't hurt I'll continue on you know what I'm trying to say would it hurt to take just one shot why don't we just do it once after that will not do it again you know premarital sex we'll just try it if I survive the paddle what hurt would it make just once we thought that if we can survive Jesus may have allowed us we are nothing different from this detachment who have been asked to arrest Jesus That night, when Judas left the Passover and the last dinner with Jesus, he was doomed in his fate. Friends, don't ever think that your education will change your character alone. You may have an education and yet be immature in many decision makings oh I have seen several of them with PhDs at the end of their names I have sat with them in committees but they and we may have Head many times immaturely not discerning the mind of God what God needs is a sincere clean heart willing and yielding to his will friends don't ever think that when your degree has been conferred on graduation when that tassel has been tipped over the other side, you are three steps, five steps, ten steps closer to Jesus. No. God wants you to learn from this institution so by it, you may serve effectively in what God has chosen you to do. But that, not in any way, have made us better than the others. The finest people I have read from the scriptures don't have high educational profiles. And yet God afforded them to share with His ministry. I encourage you to study well. I encourage you to finish with excellence your degrees. But in so doing, do not forget do not forget that the best things in this world aren't taken by the education you have. In fact, no matter how much you have spent for nursing, you don't bring it to heaven. 
Have you heard Mam Monreal speak last night? She was wondering, what will be your job in heaven? I made that question to my wife years ago. From the tree of life, you have the lives to heal perpetually every nation who would partake of it. There is no need for a doctor in the presence of God. And she begins to tell me, Dad, with the same question, are you still going to do soul winning in heaven? Will there someone be baptized in heaven? Definitely none. But I'm sure whether nurse or preacher, we will all come to worship God in heaven. Value worship, my friends. Whenever you feel that worship comes between your studies, think about it twice. You can't bring your degree to heaven. Master it with excellence so that you can serve God's people in this place. But don't forget the better thing. Judas lost this perspective. He just wanted the material thing. He wanted to press Jesus to hit and sit himself on the throne. Probably by this, because Judas pressed him, he will be seated on the right. He was missing the whole point. He was losing his clear perspective of the mission of Jesus. When he appeared there to kiss Jesus, whether by the cheek or by the forehead, the thing is, Satan was in his heart. Friends, there are only two entities who could reside in your heart. Definitely, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you have someone else in your heart. And as we consider that, may we also look and consider Malchus who lost it here in this story. In verse 49, when those around him saw what was going to happen, when those around him saw, who was those those? Who were these those? The disciples of Jesus. When they saw Jesus was about to be arrested, you know, Barkada thing, one for all, all for one, how could they hide in stones and rocks seeing Jesus? Most especially Peter. There we have the man Peter before Malchus in this story. When they begin to see that there, were, there was a detachment coming close to Jesus, Judas, who was perceived to be the betrayer, have kissed Jesus already. They knew that Jesus will be taken. You see how feeble the disciples were? How they thought to use their swords to defend Jesus. They must have forgotten how Jesus has commanded the seas, the waves and the wind. They must have forgotten how Jesus multiplied the bread and the fishes. They must have forgotten how Jesus walked on sea. They must have forgotten how Elijah and Moses was transfigured with Jesus. He could have snapped and called just one single angel who can kill by the thousands. In the Old Testament, one angel killed close to half a million. What is 500? But the disciples, most especially Peter, forgot all of this. The detachment forgot it. Malchus forgot it. Judas forgot it. So was Peter. You see, everybody forgetting many things in this point. How many of us, in times of our despair, have forgotten what Jesus can do to our lives? There's just one question this week. 
supposedly answered in our Bible answer portion. But I'd like to make that clear question. The question was, what do you think, Pastor, could be the answer why we see some of our classmates, some of our clinical instructors, prosper than me even if they're doing wrong and I am following you you know so what can I do I just even sat more intently and asked more when I came home I was talking with my wife and she was telling me the same thing the same question raised among students and so I, I tried hearing him more. What, what do you mean with that? You see, Pastor, we have been trying to go to worship in our dormitories. We attend PIC during our worship times. We join the choir. We join in small groups. We pray to God. We honor our parents. But look, On the other hand, in contrast, look at these classmates. They are the ones who instead of coming to Revival Series, will attend a birthday party. Who when offered to drink, will drink. Should I continue with the list? But the bottom line is, they are the ones doing well with their grades. You know, when I heard that question, I swallowed strong. Is Jesus present in CON? Who, who never extended the ministry to our students all the while they were thinking work, salary, work, salary but look at them they're okay in the same way I'd like to read to you just in passing some chapter 37 I don't want you to read this one when you get home, I want you to reflect on this one. This is the very answer. This is the Bible answer to that question. You're not alone in asking that question. Pastor, you said, you know, it's wrong to give and yield yourself to a master, to a fraternity. Think about that question, Pastor. They are the ones who are going well. Thirty-seven, verse one of Psalms, the man who was named to be the friend of God, David, said, "Do not fret because of evil doers." Are you with me? Does your Bible have that version? Do not fret because of evil doers, nor be envious. Of the workers of sins or iniquity. Do not frown on them. Do not be envious of them. Verse 2. For they shall soon be cut down. Like the grass. And wither as the green herb. But instead. David said in his experience. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall what? He shall what? Come on! He shall give you the desires of your heart. God is not forsaking you. He may allow sin to prevail for a time and make man do. 
rich for a while, but his end thereof will be what? Eternal destruction. Don't get weary doing good. For our benchmark of success is not the wealth, authority, possession, and status, and education of the world. Our benchmark, our standard of success is faithfulness to God. When I see you someday, 10 years, 15 years from now, having earned your degrees and your licenses, and probably the kind of life you have always wanted, when I shake your hands, I meant with that hand, are you still faithful to Jesus because you may donate much of your money but when you have lost your faith my friend in Jesus that is certainly not success to Judas he thought it would just be that way but he was a failure he was a failure and then here comes Peter. You know Peter, the kind of the haughty guy, drew his sword right away. Subukan ninyong tanganan yan. You, you know the kind of very impulsive, not only very impulsive, but have always wanted to impress Jesus. You know? Do you have friends like that? who have promised you they will give off their neck for you? Huh? You are BF? Best friend? Or BBF? BFF? Mine is B BF. They can promise you with so much. And they mean it. They mean it with all sincerity. Let's not judge their motives. But you see, sincerity just can't come along in times of crisis. There will be occasions when this sincerity will turn out to be sour because at the very onset, it was banking on wrong grounds. I could always imagine the detachment is there encircling Jesus, Judas approaching Jesus, kissing him, and here's Peter. He knew that Jesus has prophesied for this one. He drew his sword. He flew like a ninja. Oh goodness. Look at the profile of Peter in the entire synoptics. I tell you, he can just do anything with his might no wonder he has led the church so many years at the times when they the church are being persecuted Jesus knew where to place the man for his talents don't covet the talents of others when you don't have it because Jesus has a purpose for your own life and we were told in the story, verse 49, And those around him saw what was going to happen. They said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Look at verse 50. And one of them, who is this? Who could be else than the haughty Peter? Huh? One of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And this was Malchus. Class, I'm sorry. Church. When Peter made the question, Lord, shall we strike with sword? They never waited and meant for an answer from Jesus. Am I right? They made the question just to tell Jesus, whether you like it or not, I'll chop off the ear of that man. Asintado si Peter. 
Yeah. From a distance with a sword, if you're not a marksman, you wouldn't be able to amputate that ear. Because that will be close to the eyes. This gives me a practical idea that Peter in his entire ministry when Jesus ascended to heaven knew how to use the sword. But it was also him who said, the word of God is like a double-edged sword. He knew what he was talking about, the word of God. Amen? Once he used it to cut his, the ear of an enemy, now he uses the word of God to reach out for a soul and bring him to Jesus. What a transformation in the life of Peter. Friends, how many of us are like these disciples? You know, you ask God, but you have already preconceived ideas. Right? Lord, should we draw our swords? Should we strike them? But your question is not waiting for an answer. You want to do your own way. You want to do your own preference. Then you cover yourself under the, fa the facade. Lord, I want to know your will. They never waited for Jesus. Because had they waited, Jesus would have told them, don't do it. My kingdom is not of arms, but of hands that will be crucified later on. Many times we pray like Peter, like his disciples, with already answers. Lord, who would I choose between Jego and Damian? When all the while you have already wanted Damian. When with your circumstances, it's clear that Jesus is saying, take Jego. You are rationalizing in favor of Damian. Friends, we are like the disciples who may have asked Jesus whether they would draw their swords or not. But all the while, they're already fixed in their minds. Lord, what would you want me to do? Go to America and be a close, open and close quote, missionary nurse? Or you want me to stay in the Philippines and be a open and close quote missionary nurse? Jesus impresses you to stay. Come on, Lord. I can serve you there. How many times do we pray and yet we are not yielding to the will of God? We are just waiting Jesus to affirm what we wanted. There's so much to learn with this story, friends. I have enjoyed reading it this morning. I, I praise God that my Jesus is always a God of second chances. And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. There's something special with that right ear, my friends. I have all the authority to tell you because I have a beautiful right ear than any of you. If science would be research, the ears are not primarily and only for what? Hearing. But there's something right there inside your ears or your this part of your ear that keeps you what? Stand upright. Could it be that when you lost your ear, you also lose your balance? Not probably the only protruding ear. In our spiritual life, my friends, once you cease to hear the word of God, once you cease to hear the words in prayer, you lose also your spiritual balance. Amen? 
once you use that ear for something else than what it is purposely created for, you also lose your balance. If you use that ear for your rock music, if you use that ear for any other thing that does not honor God, whether you have done it or somebody may have done it, you are going to lose your spiritual balance. In the case of Malchus, he lost it already long before Peter got off his ear. When he joined the high priest on this arrest, we are pretty sure that he was not in his righteous mind. He connived, he conceded to the plan despite the evidences of what Jesus did in his ministry of healing touch. And so when Malchus had this off, you know what Jesus said? Verse 51, But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. What's your translation? I checked this one. There are several translations to it. The other a positive, the other is negative. How is it translated in your Bible? Come on, look at your Bibles. Never worship without your Bibles. Never come to church without your Bibles. Huh? No more of this. Mine says, permit even this. Are these contradict contradicting statements? The essence is, allow this one to happen. What he was saying, no more of this was on the part of Peter. But allow this to happen for prophecy's sake because it must happen to glorify the Son of God. When this happened, the most amazing touch ever recorded, that of Jesus, happened. Verse 51, And he touched the what? The ear and healed Malchus. You see, friends, amidst all the turmoil, amidst all the chaos that Jesus went through, despite his emotional distress, he just cried to the Father. He just wanted to be spared from this cup of suffering. He could have centered his thoughts towards himself. And yet, at this point, he was never barred to heal someone with his touch. Jesus could have opted not to save an enemy. Jesus could have opted, yan ang makuha mo. Jesus could have opted, good for you. And despite of that, Jesus found an opportunity to exemplify love in the most unfavorable place, circumstance, and unfavorable man. Malchus was the unfavorable man, an enemy. The arrest was the unfavorable circumstance. And the garden of Gethsemane filled with darkness was the unfavorable place. And yet with unfavorable man, with unfavorable circumstance, with unfavorable place, Jesus chose to do the favorable thing for Malchus. Amen? Amen? You don't dictate on Jesus on morality. In him emanates only the good things. When you are connected with the Father, when you are touching hands with the Father, with that of heaven, in you, in whatever circumstance, you will do just the good thing. Friends, this noontime, I want you to realize that Jesus will do the most unfavorable that may seem to you. But He is just ready to perform that so you may glorify Him. He loves you so much. 
when that ear flew from the head of Peter, Jesus knew where it exactly landed. I could have almost seen Malchus went down the ground. But as Jesus picked up the live ear and got it straight to the head of Malchus, he was saying, he was having in his heart, he was caring for Malchus. That never will you be separated from my love. But the agony of being separated from the Father was His to survive so that you and me may have hope. Malchus survived the separation of his ear. But Jesus was to be separated from the love of the Father so that you and me may have hope to the forgiveness of our sins. Friends, have you ever realized what Jesus did for you? Probably it's not only your ear that has been separated by in you and from you. But I'm sure when Jesus comes into your life, he will replace, He will restore, He will put things right as if they were new again. Not most of you will mind the experience of Malchus. Because you are not in crisis. But you will again remember what Jesus did for Marco, Malchus. When you come, when your time would come to question the sufferings of life. I'm glad that the story never ended with Malchus dying. Because the story says in verse 50, verse 51, And he touched the ear of Malchus, and he was healed. God offers the same healing to us this day. I wish and pray that we will all come to him. Never believe that there is such a thing that can separate you from God. For Jesus promised, the Bible has promised, that in his love, we will never be separated from him. Love Jesus more. Come to Jesus. Be touched and be healed. I wish we could sing once more that song, He Touched Me. And as we do that one, don't allow the devil to take your mind away and play with whatever you are handling right now. Think about your past experience with Jesus. Have you ever felt the strong need of His touch in your life? You know, friends, even among the twelve, there was one person who was careless. Even in this same room, while others are coming to Jesus in sincerity, while the Holy Spirit is moving and hovering, over the hearts who have realized their need of Jesus. There are just those who don't feel that Jesus must come into their lives. There are just those who can laugh it out, who can play it out. But Jesus nevertheless loves you. He wants you to come to Him. Don't lose that opportunity to come to Jesus.
would like to come to Jesus this day. All of us would like to be touched. I won't ask you to stand for that one. But if for some reason you have a very, very heavy burden to bring to Jesus at this very moment, that I invite you, my friend, just to stand wherever you're seated. Only those who have that very, very heavy burden to come to Jesus. As we sing this refrain once more, I want you to pray for the last time in this series. Invite Jesus to come into your heart honestly and tell Him all that you have done to dishonor, to disobey, and to dislodge Him from your heart. We've got to come to Him honestly admitting our faults. And then can we only repent and ask for forgiveness. Let's do that, friends. He's touched me. my soul something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole Father God Tonight we can only come to you. This morning we can only come to you with thoughts of burdens in all the things that we have done in the past to put your name in shame. We have neglected that important part to stand as a faithful Christian, a light for others to see. Dear Lord, we're very happy that things and time are still with our sight. It's never too late to come to you. But we are weak. We don't have the strength to overcome. Please take us by our hands and help us walk to you straight from this day on. Oh yes, it will be very hard to abandon the things that we have been used to do. And many a times, though we know it's a sin, we have accustomed to live by it. Thank you, dear Lord, for that realization today that we can still overcome if we would only yield our hearts to you. O oh God, reconnect us once more to your grace. Attach us once more to that forgiveness that we long for. O oh God, restore our broken ear and relationship with you. Touch us another time. Take what we have lost, dear Lord, and restore in us that sweet communion that we can have in prayer and by reading your Bible. Dear Lord, in this congregation are many Peter whom you can restore. There are many disciples in this congregation, dear Lord, who are just waiting that you would take them by their hands so that once more they can walk with you in faithfulness. 
Yes, they may stumble from time to time. But we know we have a Savior who have commanded the winds and the waves, who have raised the dead from their graves, who have restored words in tongue, hearing in ears, sight from their eyes. Oh God, help us and forgive our unbelief. Help us to be faithful to you, though we may be shaken, because we know the rewards of faithfulness are with you when you shall come from the clouds of heaven. But Father, we also pray for the Judas in this congregation. You know them, dear Lord. Many a times they're troubled just to come because they fear hell. They fear to be abandoned by their friends. Oh Lord, they also need your touch. They also need the touch that will remind them that they need a Savior like you who read their minds and their hearts. Father, bless us all in this college of nursing. Right from the dean to the last instructor, to the first student, to the least among our students, bind us in that cord of love and harmony that if ever you may use us in this campus, let Jesus be lifted up so that men may be drawn to him. Oh God, we specially pray for the students who have decided to follow you as their personal Savior, accept you in baptism, from now on walk with them, write their names in the book of life, and may we grow them together in our midst in the same faith and grace that you have for all of us. Thank you for Jesus Christ, who has never failed to touch our minds and hearts, who have stretched out with those same hands of healing and touch that you and me may be crucified with him and have hope to eternal life. And this we ask in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus. Amen.